we're going to first talk about some papers I have. I'm looking like a real teacher over here. I've got all my papers laid out. Um, I brought some, if any of you did not get the papers for Hinduism. Okay, how many need them for Hinduism? I need that. Uh, no, I wasn't here last week. Okay, so I have one here that's a glossary of some of the major terms. Oh, is this one? Yes. And then I have one of a handout of a practitioner. You have the most. Okay. Did you get that? Okay, I got a glossary. And that's what? Yeah, that's what I'm passing out. Okay. Anybody else? Go, oh, have these. You wouldn't remember them. Okay, this is the glossary for Buddhism. And I wrote up here Buddhism terms because it cut it off and then it cut off what I wrote. So, you know, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, go ahead and pass one down if you'd like. Try and these are just handy references, and most of these words, remember, are in the language of Pali. Some are in Sanskrit, but we'll get to that in a minute. Hi, Paul. Oh, there's a thing. Oh, I'm glad you made it, man. We drank lunch. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one I passed out at the beginning of the class. This is a rough timeline of what we're talking about. Who does not have this? This is a very simple, rough timeline. And uh, it's helpful to see this. I am not a numbers person, so to me, I like just rough ideas of dates uh, and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just, I think we can have them back to pass. We have, we have all these. Oh. Do you want me to leave some on the table in case somebody else comes? Sure. Uh, right. Anybody else timeline? Anybody else want a timeline if you have one? Do you have one? Okay. So, and I'll explain this in a minute, but let me just finish passing it out. Okay, now this one I did not staple. But you need, I don't know, you can, you can handle it. You need one of each of these. The first page is called The Pure Offering Every Day. And then the second page is the picture of these two people. These are practicing Buddhists. So, as I said before, generally when I talk about a religion, because I'm not a practitioner, obviously, of all of these, I like to give you a testimonial from somebody who lives this. Because people that live it have a different perspective, of course. So if you want to go ahead and take one of each of these, they go together, um, and you can take a look at that later on. And then finally, we have the sign-up sheet for the Hindu temple for this Saturday. Anybody want to sign up that did not already sign up? But I need to know what time we meet Well, the tour is at 10, so get there a few minutes earlier. You might want to anyway. So the tour is at 10, the tour is free, but if you want to stay for a lunch at the little cafe area, uh, it's, it's part of the temple, but of course they charge, not a lot, but you know, you can get uh, Indian food that's pretty good, so if you want to stay, I'm, I'm going to stay, and some of us are going to stay, so if you'd like to. Do you get a set at a table, or you have to sit on the floor? No, you sit at a table. Yeah, when you go into the temple part, you take off your shoes, so just keep that in mind, and they ask that you cover your arms and your legs. Men too? Yes. <laughs> yes. Arms and legs. Arms and legs. Cover it up yeah. so you don't need to wear a head covering. Like in synagogues, men are asked to cover their heads. In mosques, women are asked to cover their heads. But neither one are asked to cover their heads in a Hindu temple. Sometimes it's also called a mandir, a Hindu mandir. So that is happening on Saturday. I'm really excited to go. Both of my kids are not going. They've been here several times, but they're not going. I think Eric's going with me, too. So, anyway, I will see you all there. Huge parking lot. There should be plenty of parking. You all know where this is? It's in Chino Hills. Yeah. So, literally, like, Google, you know, Chino Hills Hindu Temple, and it'll come up. It's the BAPS. Um, Sri Swami Narayan Mandir. Yeah, it's a long. Giant. It's next to the freeway. Oh yeah, you can't miss it. I mean, right on the uh, 71 freeway, right? Right. right on 71, it looks like a big sandcastle. It's gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. That place you've always driven. By. Yeah. Where, where do we meet at? In the very front of the Let's, place. Yes. Yeah, so if you go in, there's a parking lot, and then there's the temple that looks very obvious with the big steps going up. It looks very temple-y. But the the building on the right is a visitor center. Let's meet there, the visitor center. In the front of it. In the front of it. That's how we like check in and get our tour started and get everything going. Okay? And if you know anybody else, I'm, I'm mentioning this in my um, e-blast this week, but if you know anybody else that's signed up to go, you might just want to give them a quick reminder. I'll be in touch with a few of them as well. Okay, so um, this timeline. This is just, as I said, a rough timeline. But we're teaching these 
Not, not all of them chronologically. We're, te we're teaching them in terms of Eastern religions and then moving to Western religions. So we started with indigenous religions. Indigenous religions are before the timeline. You know, we don't know when they started. They started with the dawn of civilization. So the earliest one here is Hinduism, because Hinduism, remember, is a collection of indigenous religions of India. It's really not one religion, which is why people are um, a little bit contentious about what, you stand, what Hinduism stands for, because Hinduism stands for so many, 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 many things, because really it didn't develop as one religion with one founder. Unlike Christianity and Islam and Buddhism, which began with one founder, and so those religions are more simplified. But Hinduism was a collection of all kinds of Indian religions, and that's why it was so complex, as I'm sure you realized when we talked about it over the last few weeks, right? Mm -hmm. All these ideas of, you know, different ethical standards, the, the idea of dharma, your ethical standards are different depending on how old you are, what caste you're in, what your personality is, what your chosen goals are, you know, all the complexities of that, plus all of the many, many, in fact, the idea is that there are millions of gods and goddesses. So I think you'll find Buddhism much less complex because it's really one religion that then divided as religions do, like Christianity is divided into denominations. Buddhism is divided as well. So we'll talk about some of the divisions, but it started from one person. But if you look at this, we'll look at Abraham and Moses later when we look at Western religious traditions. So right now, look down here. Do you see where it says Gautama Buddha? Okay, that was the beginning of Buddhism. At the same time, Taoism began, and at the same time, Confucianism began. So all of these Asian religions are approximately 500 years before Christianity began. Now, this timeline is off by a few years. Jesus wasn't born in the year zero. Jesus was born between 4 and 6 BCE. By the way, are you familiar with the, the, the terminology BCE and CE? So it used to be called BC and AD. Um, Anno Domini means year of our Lord in Latin, and the B.C. is before his birth. But those are very Christian terms, obviously. They're based on Jesus. And so academia, in an effort to be more pluralistic and broaden its language, has not stuck with Christian terms, but they've changed the terms. If you look up here, A.D. is now in academic uh, circles called C.E., Common Era. And then B.C.E. is before the Common Era. But it still is, it's still those same years of BC and AD. It's just notated differently. Got it? Okay, so Christianity began approximately at the year zero. It's off by a few years, and Jesus didn't actually begin the movement until he was, you know, like 29 or so years old. But um, it's approximately the year zero. So Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism are approximately 500 years younger. I'm sorry, older. Oh. Then Christianity, Islam is approximately 500 years younger than Christianity. So Islam is approximately a 1,500-year-old religion. And Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism are approximately 2,500 years old. Got it? So again, those are, those are general uh, numbers, but they can help you, I think, understand you know, where we're coming from. So when you think of the word Buddhism, or when you think of the idea of the religion of Buddhism, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Or what, do you, what have you heard from media, neighbors, friends, anybody? Meditation. Okay, meditation. Who said meditation? I heard somewhere. Yeah, very much so. It's an important part of this religion. It's not, it's not something that's seen as fringy or that only a few people do it. Like how in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, there are those mystical strands. But in Buddhism, it's much more practiced, very much so. Yeah, and we'll talk about what that means when we get into this. What else? What comes to mind when you think of Buddhism? Buddha, the big fat guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about that a little bit last time, and and uh, Tom said he read an article about that in the paper, where somebody had a question about that. Yeah, the big the big guy. Have you seen the big guy a statue of the Buddha in Chinese restaurants and so forth? That's a particular Buddha known as Maitreya Buddha. Maitreya Buddha is, okay, is known as the Buddha of the future. And a statue was, was originally made from a jolly old man in a village 
and everybody loved this man. And so th this is how the story goes anyway. It might be urban legend, but somebody needed to create a sculpture of the Buddha of the future, not the Buddha that started Buddhism. And they said, why don't you just base it off of this guy that everybody loves? And so the Buddha, the one, the historical Buddha, uh, did not look anything like that. So it's kind of interesting that he, he was not this big, round, jolly, almost like a Santa Claus-looking guy that you rub his tummy for good luck. But that's, that's the Buddha of the future, Maitreya. What else comes to mind when you think about Buddhism? Dalai Lama? Yeah, the Dalai Lama. He is one of the, well, he's probably the most important, most well-known, most famous figures of one of the three divisions of Buddhism. So we'll talk probably on another day, but we'll get into the divisions of Buddhism. Okay, so let's start uh, talking about this religion. And, and, you know, like always, I'll just sort of lecture and throw out some stuff, but interrupt me. Ask questions if you ever want to. If you have a question or comment, just raise your hand, shout it out. I'm sure if you're thinking it, probably others are as well. So Buddhism, like Hinduism, arose in ancient India. This is an Indian religion that then traveled into East Asia, China, Japan, Thailand, and so forth. It's a smaller tradition today in India, but it began in India. It's smaller, you said? It is smaller in India than it used to be. It's a very small tradition in India, but it's much larger in China, Japan, Korea, Thailand. Um, but in stark contrast to Hinduism that began with all these different streams converging into this one religion that we call it, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism began with just simply one man. One man. Now, nobody believes that the Buddha is God. He's not divine. He's just a man. And his name is not Buddha. Buddha is a title. So he is called the Buddha. Generally, sometimes people say Buddha, but generally he's referred to as the Buddha. Like we might say the Christ, like a title. The Buddha uh, comes from a root word, bud, which means awaken. So the Buddha means the awakened one. He's a person. He's not any angel or god or divine figure, but he's an exceptional man because of what he did. And that is that he woke up. He woke up to full awareness of what does it mean to be a human being? What's going on with all of us? We talk a lot about how religions have an understanding of point A, the human what, condition. What, was he a human? Was he a person? And then he woke up? And, uh, yeah, he but, a, a but he stayed a person. Huh? He stayed a person. Yeah. He's a person and he, he woke up to he what is Yes. He woke up to I don't yeah, I don't mean waking up like after sleeping. I mean like you know this full awareness, like this aha moment of what's going on with the human condition. You know, we, we talk about this all the time. With every religion, there is an understanding of what's going on with the human condition. Meaning, why are we not living in a state of absolute peace, perfection, joy all the time? And so usually the analysis is not, why are there good things? Because we, we often take that for granted. We expect there to be good things. But we ask the question, why are there bad things? Why is there suffering? Why is there war? Why is there poverty? Why is there all, all the things we don't like? What's going on? And every religion has an analysis of this, but the answer to that question is different depending on the religion. And then every religion has this point B of their goal. Where do they want to go? What, you know, we, we don't just want to stay in this place. We want to go someplace either physically or spiritually or emotionally, go someplace better. We want to develop. We want to deepen or we want to become more peaceful or more joyful or something. And then the path between the two is the path of salvation. So what he woke up to was the answer to that question, according to Buddhism. He understood what's going on with the human condition. It wasn't a mystery to him anymore. And he understood what the ultimate aim and goal is or should be of each person. And he understood the path of salvation. And he did the path of salvation. He attained this goal. So Buddhists believe that he solved everything. 
that he woke up to absolute everything. This is often what's called enlightenment. And that's a very common Buddhist term. Now, some people think that enlightenment is super rare. But I've had students, young ones, teenagers that were Buddhist, tell me that they're enlightened. So not everybody considers it rare. But he did this. He woke up to this. He transcended the human condition. He somehow went beyond <coughs> the human condition in his lifetime. That doesn't mean he died, because he didn't die then. He died later, but not at that moment. So fundamental to his discoveries then is that human beings are by nature prone to suffer. We must suffer. It's not that we want to, but we know that every single person does. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of those um, truisms that helps me in preaching. I'm, not, I'm under no illusion that what I'm preaching to you, only half of you are going through challenges. Right? You're all people. We all go through challenges. That's part of what it means to be a person. And, you know, I used to tell my students, I hardly know you. I know you folks a lot better than I knew most of my college students. And I would say, but I am positive every single one of you is suffering in some way. Now, it doesn't mean in some intense, huge way. It could be something small. It could be something that's pleasant that's been removed out of their lives. It could be something that's just a little bit difficult, like a job that's just a little bit challenging. It could be a relationship that's just not going as smoothly as it once did. And we know this, though. Everybody has challenges. As Charles Dickens said, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and it always is. So that was one of his discoveries. Human beings are by nature prone to suffer. So in a manner very much like a physician, he went about diagnosing the problem. Why are we suffering? What's going on? What's making us suffer? And then proceeded to um, prescribe a cure like a physician. Do this and you won't suffer. Buddhism doesn't generally say, take my word for it, you know, and believe what I say. Um, that's a very faith-based religion that would say that. Christianity is very faith-based. Where we would say, you know, we, we walk by faith, not by sight, and, and believe in your heart and trust Jesus and things like that. I talk like that all the time. I encourage your faith that you already have. Because as Christians, we believe you have been given faith by God. And so I'm, I'm encouraging it as your pastor all the time. And we encourage one another. And when you read your Bible, it reminds you of your faith and you wake up to those things. And your intuition is how you know faith, even though you don't have proof of it. But Buddhism doesn't go that route. Buddhism doesn't say, believe me that this glass of water is cold. It says, here, drink the water, you'll see. So the Buddha never said, just believe me. The Buddha said, do what I've done, and you'll see what I've seen. Don't take my word for it. Do what I've done. But I get ahead of myself. Let's look at this uh, person's life. Um, he was born, my glasses to see this over here. He was born uh, in about 563 BCE, and full accounts of his life were not written down until hundreds of years after his death, which is very different than Jesus, by the way, where full accounts are written down just like a decade or two after his death. So we're very lucky in our tradition that we have um, Pretty good records, actually, the life of Jesus. But the life of Buddha, the Buddha, we don't have super good records, but still accounts were written down, and, and even Buddhists themselves say that some of this might be legendary. But we know from when we first started talking, do you remember how we were talking about the idea of myth in religion? Remember that concept that in religious studies, myth does not mean a lie. Myth means a deep, sacred truth. So... If you recall, I said that Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, said that to take myth at only face value is like going into a restaurant and opening up the menu and seeing the word spaghetti on the menu and then eating the menu. <laughs> Not realizing that that word represents something else, right? So with all these myths, we could take them at, meaning sacred stories of all these religions, we could take them at face value or dismiss them because they must not be true, or we could look behind them saying, what does this represent? What is the truth here, capital T truth? 
not necessarily historic or scientific truth, but deep, meaningful, mythological truth that says things about relationships and wisdom and love and things like that that you can't put into um, an equation. Make sense? Okay, so uh, this boy was born in approximately 563 BCE. He was the future Buddha, but he's not called the Buddha at this point because he's not awakened. We don't give him that title. We don't even refer to him as the Buddha until he undergoes this time of spiritual awakening. So he was given the name Siddhartha, and some, sometimes it's pronounced Siddhartha, like it's not an H at the end, but it's spelled like that, Siddhartha or Siddhartha. Uh, his full name was Siddhartha Gautama because Gautama was his family name. So sometimes he's just simply referred to as Gautama. So when we go to the Buddhist temple, and I'll get that arranged as soon as I can, maybe like in a month or so from now, when we go visit the Buddhist temple, when you hear the tour guide or other people saying Gautama this and Gautama that, they're referring to the Buddha. So he was born into the warrior caste. Remember that when we talked about the warrior caste in Hinduism? He came right out of Hinduism, sort of like Martin Luther coming right out of the Catholicism of 1500s you know, Europe. So here we have the Buddha born into the warrior caste, the Kshatriya caste. You remember that? It's a very high caste with a lot of prestige right underneath the Brahmin or the priestly caste. So his father was the ruler. He was a prince of a small region in northern India at the time. So Gautama was born into this position of worldly power. And according to traditional Buddhist belief, he was destined, destined to be one of two things. Either he would be the savior of the world, or he would be a universal king, like his father, with worldly power, but much larger than his father, because his father just had one small region. So there were miraculous events <coughs> surrounding his birth, just like there are miraculous events surrounding lots of births of these big leaders. He was said to have come out of his mother's side, and he immediately took seven paces so he could walk immediately. And he started speaking immediately. And he declared that in this lifetime, he would gain enlightenment. So there was a sage, and a sage at this place in time means a, a learned, wise, spiritual person. And this sage saw this and saw this boy's perfect form as this perfect child and said that indeed he would, in this lifetime, gain enlightenment and become a savior. Now this doesn't mean necessarily how we understand the word savior, meaning divine. It just means somebody who would in some way save and help the people. So his father didn't want him to become a savior though. His father wanted him to become like him, but more so, a person of worldly power. And you know those Greek tragedies? Have you ever read those Greek tragedies where in order to, people try to avoid their fate, and so they take another route, and then they walk right into their fate? Oedipus Rex and things like that, those old time plays. Okay, so this is exactly what happened to Gautama. His father wanted him to avoid the fate of becoming a savior. So his father sheltered him from seeing anybody or anything that he would ever want to save. If you don't let a child see people in need, then maybe, his father thought, he won't grow up having this sense of compassion to want to save anybody. Okay? So, Gautama already was in this palace. He lived in this palace because his father was this local prince. And his father set up this situation where Gautama was surrounded by all the luxuries money could buy. So that he would grow up and want to become a king like his dad, or like, sort of like his dad, and even more so. He was surrounded by beautiful, thousands of beautiful dancing girls. He eventually uh, married the finest maiden of the kingdom. He had all kinds of servants. Uh, he and his wife had a son at one point, and it would seem as though Prince Siddhartha would have this life of complete satisfaction. Now imagine if you had never seen anybody in any kind of real pain. Imagine what that would do then when you did see somebody in pain. 
because you're not slowly desensitized to it. Imagine the shock of seeing somebody in pain for the first time if you've been protected and sheltered to this extent all your life for decades. He was not allowed to see anybody growing much, very, very old. He was not allowed to see anybody sick, and he never knew of death. Imagine. Uh, so, did yeah. his father get a little suspicious when he popped out the side and walked around for instead of being, and started talking? Well, <laughs> well now this kid might not go my way. Yeah, right, but he wanted so much for the kid to go his way. So, and again, we could say that's, you know, biologically impossible for a child to do that. But again, I would suggest that we look at the mythological truths of this story. What is this saying mythologically? That he strode seven paces and already talked and declared that he would become a savior. What is it saying? But he's special. He's special. He's wise. He's talented. He can foresee the future. Oh. He's got confidence. Right? I mean, it's saying these mythological things. And, um, and yeah, his father might have been a little suspicious, you know? I mean, we can wonder this about Joseph, who raised Jesus. He was probably a little weirder now, too, you know? <laughs> these stories are amazing. And the story, the story of Lao Tzu, when we talk about Taoism, is amazing. He was like 82 years old when he was finally born. He was born with long, flowing white hair, because that what? mythologically says he was extraordinarily wise. Who, 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 who Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, we'll get there. Oh, Taoism. Oh, I'm I'm who, 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 yeah, no, no. But I mean, these birth narratives, these birth who, narratives are, are trying to prove a point. Hard birth. Oh, <laughs> I know, I thought nine months was a long time to carry a child. But the birth narratives are trying to prove a point as to how special, how unique, how, you know, what a mystical moment this is. And um, it, it doesn't mean that it's not historically or scientifically true that this happens. It means that's not the point. That's not the point. So we've, we've discussed this a little bit before, but the, this kind of helps me. When I think of historical and scientific truth, I think of an access, and when I think of religious truth, I think of another one. So history tells us how things go, you know, how things develop, whether it's evolutionary theory or, you know, the, the best that we have is our science right now. And 100 years from now, it'll be even better. It's getting better and better and better and better all the time. It's amazing. Science is incredible. It's another way to know, I think, the revealed will of God. And yet, and yet, science cannot and history cannot tell us some of the depth that religious truths tell us. So do we want to throw out the Garden of Eden? In, in our denomination, not in every denomination, but in our Christian denomination, we generally accept the best of science, like evolutionary theory. So does that mean that we need to throw out the Garden of Eden story? Not at all, because Genesis tells us some things about relationship, about love, about value, about trust, about betrayal, about hope. Things that science doesn't have vocabulary for any more than religion having vocabulary for things like evolution. So they're just different ways of knowing, okay? So in these birth narratives, it doesn't mean that it's historically and scientifically accurate or inaccurate. We're not, that's, not, that's another really good question, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is this, this level. You know, how do we understand what it means? So in this case, what this means was that he was a special child, he was totally different, and that his father was threatened and wanted to keep him protected so that he wouldn't become, or wouldn't even want to become, a savior of the world. So, he goes through then, as he, as he grows up, he goes through a, a, a series of famous episodes known as the Four Passing Sights. Four Passing Sights. And these are four times he's out in the countryside seeing things. Now, what's supposed to happen is when he goes out on these sort of pleasure excursions in his chariot out into the countryside, outside the shield of his palace, his servants are supposed to clear the way and make sure the, or he's not the Buddha yet, that Gautama doesn't see anybody that would elicit compassion in him. But, as the story goes, 
the servants weren't doing their jobs, <laughs> and the gods, this comes out of Hinduism, polytheistic, the gods are working really hard to make sure that Prince Siddhartha does see what he needs to see to become the savior of the world. So, the first passing sight. He goes on this pleasure excursion out into the countryside, and for the first time, he sees an old man. He is in his 20s, and it's the first time he sees a very old man, and he broods over the implications of this. He realizes that we're all growing older, and remember, it's not something that since he was a child, he was really aware of, so it really hits him that we all age, that it's the fate of all of us, that we can do nothing to stop the passing of time. And he realized this fate was in store for everybody, his family, his loved ones, even himself. On a second ride out into the countryside, he sees a diseased man looking very ill, and he had never seen this before either. And at this time, he was deeply disturbed. How can people enjoy life when disease threatens us all? And then on a third trip, out to the countryside, he sees a corpse for the first time. Remember in India, in Hinduism, the bodies are prepared for cremation. So it's not buried in a coffin or anything, it's out and getting prepared to be burned. And so he sees a corpse and he understands that death is threatening us all. Death is the certain end for us all. And he was more devastated than ever before. And he thought, isn't it senseless for us to just go on living as if oblivious to the certainty of death? Now, isn't it interesting? I always find this fascinating that thousands of years later, these three things are still part of our experience. We have done so many amazing things technologically. We've cured polio, we've put people in outer space. I mean, We've done amazing medical interventions and changed organs and all that. Incredible. And yet, age, disease, and death. Still part of our experience. We cannot get around these things. And taxes. And taxes, yes. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't see that one too. and go into bigger shock than ever before. <laughs> so he realized he could no longer find contentment in all of the luxuries of the palace. And he had all the luxuries, the finest food, and the most beautiful friends, and the jewels, and the clothing. And he knew he could never again find contentment in any of that. He knew he could never feel safe again in the palace, now that he had learned the truths of old age and disease and death. And so, he mounted his horse one day, and he rode out from the palace by himself. While he was riding out, he observed the toil of all of the peasants plowing up the fields, and he realized that to the very smallest, tiniest creature, even in the dirt, death was the end of them all. Every insect, every animal, every little tiny organism, everything, death was the end of all of it. And he said that he needed to somehow find some way around this. He needed to somehow figure this out. He couldn't go back to the palace and act like he hadn't seen. Was that his fourth ride? No, no. This is only three so far. Okay. Um, so he chose then to live this homeless life of solitude. And he, he wanted to be in search of salvation, like, um, to, you know, to, to figure out a way around that human condition. So on the fourth passing site, during uh, a ride out, he saw, he met a mendicant or a monk. Uh, you, remember how we talked about those wandering ascetics in India? Wandering around and denying themselves the physical pleasures of life. So they didn't have a lot of food, mendicant, um, or ascetic. They didn't have a lot of food, they didn't uh, wear a lot of clothing, they subjected themselves to the sun, the, wind, the, the rain, and the wind, and so forth. So he saw this mendicant uh, who was living this homeless life, and the mendicant told uh, Gautama that he was searching for salvation. And so Gautama, given that he met this man, he felt like maybe there was some hope. Maybe there was a way to somehow figure out how to get around 
all of these horrible things, old age, disease, and death. And so it filled him with absolute elation. Um, and there was a way to overcome his despair. So at the age of 29, everything changed for him, which if you look at the religious leaders of the world, the ones that start religions, it's usually around age 30 that they do that. Somehow, something about that age. So at the age of 29, he gave up his life as a prince entirely. He gave it all up. He secretly left his family, he left his palace by horseback in the dark of the night. He removed all of his jewels. He dismissed his servant with a message for his father. Interestingly, you know, I, I wonder why did he not leave a message for his wife? But, <laughs> but he left a message for his father saying, I'm not leaving you out of lack of affection. I'm leaving because I really need to figure this out. I'm too deeply disturbed. I'll never find happiness again in the palace. He said that his purpose was to put an end to old age, disease, and death. So he renounced his power. He renounced any kind of sensual enjoyment, all the foods and music and dancing girls and his wife and everything. He renounced everything in order to live like the mendicant, like the ascetic, to live an austere life. Every now and then you see a picture of him where he's sitting Indian style or what's called the lotus position. And he's holding up his hair, long hair, and he's holding a sword to cut off his hair. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Maybe now you'll see that now that I'm telling you. So like his hair is like in a ponytail and he's holding a sword. At that point, that was renouncing everything. Cutting off his long hair was like cutting off his power, cutting off his worldly ties. At that point, when he cut off his hair, he, he eventually ended up shaving his head, all of his hair. Now remember all the people in India, the, not all of them, but I mean, when they got older and wiser, often they grew their hair longer, and, and that was a sign of, um, uh, again, cutting off ties from the, the world. But he cut his hair, he shaved it eventually, and uh, eventually he gave up his beautiful robes for a simple orange-yellow color robe um, of the ascetics. And Buddhists still today wear that robe and shave their heads, whether if they're monks or nuns. Whether they're men or women, they shave their heads and they wear that kind of robe that he wore. So, he came upon another group of people, five mendicants, five monks, who taught him their practice, which was extreme self-denial. And at this point, Gautama spent the next several years on the brink of starvation. The next several years trying to gain enlightenment, trying to gain salvation um, through starvation as an extreme ascetic. Tradition tells of this time in his life when he would eat a meal of a little bite of fruit, one sesame seed, and one grain of rice. Imagine, that's not a lot of food. <laughs> he had this belief at the time that the reduction of the powers of his body would rise and in increase in his spiritual powers. He was physically reduced to skin and bone, and sometimes you'll see paintings of him or statues of him in this time period, and he looks like a concentration camp victim. Have you ever seen those? You see his bones, his rib cage. Okay, that's during this time of his life. Well, starvation did not lead to salvation, he found. And so six years after leaving the palace in another famous episode, he accepted a simple meal of rice and milk. Now people all over India are generally and traditionally giving people their begging food, you know? So he had a begging bowl and he, somebody gave him some rice and some milk and he ate it and he found his um, physical energy returning to him. And these five other mendicants left him disgusted because he had sold out by eating this food. These other guys were just as skinny and bony. Yes, as he yeah. Mm -hmm. So what he discovered when he did this was he discovered the doctrine of the middle way. The middle way means a life of moderation. That, you know, he had tried the luxuries of the palace and that didn't bring him salvation. And then he went to the other extreme where he almost died of starvation and that didn't bring him salvation. So he basically said everything in moderation, which 
That makes sense, right? But the only thing is, we wouldn't be perceived by him as living in moderation. We would, all of us here, all of us here, would be perceived as living like he did in the palace. Mm -hmm. You know, because we have a lot more luxuries than he did, or his, his uh, disciples did in the middle way. But anyway, the middle way is this place where you, you don't want to overindulge, but you don't want to starve. You know, you want to find that, that balance. And Buddhism today still talks very much and holds this very dear, this concept of the middle way. So, now that he finally had his strength back, now that he felt better, contented, and strong in body, he was prepared to devote all of his energies to attaining salvation. And he sat down in, the again, the lotus position. It's called the lotus <clears throat> position. But do you, do you know what Indian style is? It used to be called that. Now my children don't even know what that means. They call it crisscross applesauce. Uh -huh. Apparently to avoid using the word Indian out of yeah. respect, which I get, but I'm just totally unfamiliar with this crisscross applesauce idea. Oh, teachers on awesome. earth. Yeah, it's just, it's just <laughs> new, yeah. Which I, I get it, it's more respectful. I guess it's like Indian style, that's, yeah. But anyway, you know when you're raised with something, you just don't think anything of it. Anyway, he got, the Buddhists generally call it the lotus position. So he's sitting in the lotus position and he's sitting down uh, under a fig tree. Um, and he resolved, I'm not going to get up until I have figured all of this out. Okay. I'm not going to get up. Yeah, talk about resolve. I will sit here until I find a way to figure out how to get around the pain of old age, disease, and death. That fig tree, still today, is called the Bodhi tree. That part, just that particular one. Because Bodhi means wisdom. So he was sitting down under a fig tree. Some of you might have heard me talk about this before, but some of you might not have. But do you remember hearing about the Axis Mundi? Any of you? OK, the Axis Mundi is something in religious studies, which means an axis something that around which Mundi is world, which, you know, the world, and in fact, the whole universe is revolving. So in all kinds of mythologies, you see something like a tree or a maypole or a teepee or the mountain that Moses ascended to talk to God or, you know, something that's like, like that, like a pole or a mountain or something. Um, the cross, you know, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden the mountain in which Muhammad was sitting when he received the Quran. Um, there's, there's often something like this, where it represents the pole or the mountain or something like this, represents a couple of things. First, it represents connecting powers of heaven and powers of earth. Okay, because powers of heaven have always been envisioned as up there, like in the sky. And powers of earth, like our world, has been envisioned as down here. So it connects the two, and everything important is happening around this. So this is, for all intents and purposes, the center of the universe. So uh, it's very meaningful uh, that he's sitting under a tree, and the tree is connecting him with all the powers he needs to have in order to gain enlightenment. So the god of death named Mara is threatened. Because the Buddha, well, he's not called the Buddha yet, she's called Gautama, or Prince Dartha, he is about to destroy death. And the god of death, remember this is out of Hinduism, where there are all these millions of gods and goddesses. Okay, the god of death is about to be destroyed. And so Mara tries to frighten him off the spot. And he won't be frightened. He won't move. So then what Mara does is he sends his three daughters to try to sort of seduce him off the spot. His three daughters, the goddesses, discontent, delight, and desire. <laughs> because he's like, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get this guy to not figure out how to deal with death. Discontent, delight, and desire do not move him off the spot either. And so what he does is he's sitting down, like if this was the ground and if I was sitting here in the lotus position, he puts his hand on the ground. And you see some statues where he's doing that, where he's putting his hand on the ground. He's calling the earth and all of the universe to witness to the fact, I am not moving 
Nothing will get me off of this spot. Holding, touching the ground. I am here to stay. So Mara realizes that he's defeated, so he and his daughters depart. So he's overcome then the distractions of fear and passion. And those two things can distract us all. Our fears that frighten us off of our spot of what we're supposed to do, or our passions that entice us and distract us away from what we're supposed to do. But he's overcome all that. And so now he does what Buddhists are taught to do, and that is turn the focus inward. So in, and I, I've said this before, but a little recap, in Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, those are traditionally known as Western religions, the majority, remember this pie chart thing here? It was just, this is a little sliver here. But all the rest of it, the majority of your average Jews, Christians, and Muslims in your average synagogues, churches, and mosques on your corners, you know, are not um, focusing inward like this. There's more, it's more common to focus outward in praise, in worship, in relationship to a sense of an external God that Jews, Christians, and Muslims are in relationship with. But you do have the mystical strand of these three religions, and we'll get to that when we get to that, where there are those slivers of traditions that do emphasize turning your focus inward. The opposite is true in Eastern religions. In Eastern religions, which is Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, and Zen Buddhism, the majority of people turn their focus inward, and it's the sliver here that's focused more outward. So it's more common to see people meditating. The other thing that's interesting is that with all these founders, whether it's Muhammad or Jesus or Confucius or Lao Tzu or the Buddha or whatever, with all these founders, when the founder receives a revelation, either from the divine, you know, God or the greater Buddha nature, or whatever, when they kind of wake up and receive a revelation, in the Western traditions, what happens is a heightened emotion. So like, for instance, Moses in Judaism, who meets God on a mountain. He meets God and he's just, you know, stunned and it's glory and his face is shining and like his, his emotions are heightened, right? Um, St. Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, blinded and this incredible experience and uh, Muhammad, you know, seeing Gabriel and receiving the Quran. It's this incredible emotion situation. The opposite is true in these religions. In these religions, generally, when there's a revelation that happens from the divine or from an inner nature or something, some kind of big spark, then the emotions quiet down. And so the Buddha has this sense of great peace calm, tranquility, not this spark of absolute joy, you know, but more like this sense of groundedness, centeredness, calm. And that then is the goal for people that are practitioners of Eastern religions. Again, in general, like I've always said, everything I ever say here is in general. Everything I ever say is a stereotype because we just simply don't have the time to go into all of the differences and all of the variations. Um, all these religions, as I've said, you can study for a lifetime. They're all very complex. But in general, this is about a, a lessening of emotion. And this is about a heightening of emotion. And again, not that he, anyone is good or bad or right or wrong. It's just different. And that, that's what makes it uh, interesting, I think. So, you with me so far? OK, any questions at this point? <laughs> you have questions, Paul? <laughs> All right, so the Buddha then is sitting under the tree. He calls the earth to witness he's not moving until he figures this whole thing out. And he goes through now three... Now he's sitting there eating figs. He's not eating anything. He's sitting under a fig tree, but he's not eating. He's not eating it. Uh, he's just he's sitting. <laughs> yeah, he's sitting under a fig tree, but he's... But yeah, he, and he's not eating. And you can still visit this tree, by the way, this Bodhi tree. Oh, it's still around? Yeah, yeah, it's very much revered by Buddhists. Yeah. Where, where is it? It's in India. India. It's northern India. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, he sits down and he goes through three periods. And they're called the first watch, the second watch, and the third watch. Like a time period in the night. 
Are you saying watch? Watch. Yeah. Like, watch. No. Just be grateful you don't have to be tested on any of this stuff. <laughs> you don't have to remember it. You betcha. <laughs> So the first watch, and they're all very, they're, they're very mythologically important as to why these times are as they are. The first watch is from evening until midnight. Midnight is that liminal time, you know, that time between days where things are scary. Horror movies are based around midnight. Horror movies don't happen at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or at 10 o'clock in the morning because that's flat in another day. That's, there's nothing scary about being in another day. It's secure, stable, solid ground. But in the middle of day, between days, that's liminal space. And liminality is always seen in religion and in anthropology as the place of fear. We don't know what to do with it, but also a place of great power. Remember we talked about this before? Mm -hmm. Okay, blood outside of a person is liminal because it's not human, but it's not not human. It's kind of between. So it's it's a taboo thing. We don't like blood. We don't want to touch blood. We get away from those things. It's also a place of great power. You know, we drink the blood of our God. All right. So the first watch is from evening till midnight. And during this time, he could perceive miraculously, this is a miracle, he could perceive all of his lifetimes. Now this comes right out of Hinduism with an understanding of reincarnation. So you get that here too. The sense that time is cyclical. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> same thing, same sense of time. And normally, people aren't able to perceive all their reincarnations because their memory is attached to their personality, which dies at every incarnation. But miraculously, you could perceive that he's gone through all these lifetimes, and in every single lifetime, he has suffered. He sees this. He's also had good things, but he realized that there was never a lifetime where he didn't suffer. Well, and that he had, was had to die. He right. had to die, so he had to suffer. Right, right, right. Yes, but he perceived all this. So then he went to what's called the second watch, and that's from midnight until four in the morning. Okay, now this is even a darker, deeper, more painful time. Midnight until 4 a.m. It's like the time before Easter sunrise service where Jesus is in the tomb and it's all dark and every hope is lost and we're all despairing. Dark is before dawn. Yeah, exactly. So this is the second watch. And during the second watch, he again miraculously perceives the reincarnations of every being. Not just his own at this point. He's acquired with both of these. He's acquired what's called the divine eye, the third eye. Um, in Hinduism, there's an understanding that we have these energy centers called chakras. And this one right here is like a sense of seeing without visually seeing. You know when you see and you don't, you don't know how you know things and you see and you don't really see, but you kind of see in visionary ways. Um, Hindu women today wear that, the dot on their head when they're married. It's a sign that they're married like, like we wear wedding rings. But it came from this um, notation of the third eye, that chakra being opened and being able to see. So at this point, during the, second, the first and second watch, he's acquired this divine eye, and he's able to see all these things. And he perceives that in every birth and rebirth of all beings, every being has suffered. Nowhere in the world was there any safety from suffering. Nowhere in the world was there an escape from death. The third watch came at around sunrise, right after four in the morning. So around sunrise. And it was, it was hope, it was, it was the answer, it was joy, it was, it was very much like our Easter sunrise service. Now we're in a new day, now there's hope, there's light, there's dawn, there's something, there's an answer to all the despairing problems. And what he discovered during this time in the third watch was the four noble truths. There's a lot in religion of like five this and seven that and ten this and four that, <laughs> if you've noticed. And we'll get even into more of them. 
but he discovered the Four Noble Truths. And uh, we'll get into that later on, uh, what those four are. But with this, he gained enlightenment. Now he's completely enlightened and thus won salvation. According to Buddhism, he won for himself, he attained for himself salvation. He went from there to there. He declared it. He, he didn't talk, he declared verbally. Well, I mean, he thinks he got there, so yes. he declared. Yes, yes, he believed, he was enlightened, and according to Buddhists, he attained salvation. Um, but he didn't die at that point. But he attained salvation, he was enlightened, he, he, he escaped from the human condition into something better, and which is what that is over there, that goal. Okay, and we'll talk in, in a little while, or maybe next time, depending on how much time we have, about what exactly happened to him during these Four Noble Truths, or discovering the Four Noble Truths. But he stayed there after he became enlightened. He stayed there for many days, actually, in that spot under the Bodhi tree, the wisdom tree. Do you have any timeline for this? How long was he under the tree? Days. Days, yes. not years. Correct. Yes. Okay, days. Okay. So he had... Perfect freedom, perfect tranquility, perfect peace. Because again, remember in the Eastern traditions, when there's some kind of a revelation or enlightenment or, or something, there's a there's a, a lessening of emotion. A anxiety uh, goes away, fear and, and stress and suffering goes goes down, as opposed to in the Western traditions where it's it's more uh, not not more anxiety but like a like a a heightened sense of. Uh, awe and wonder. Well, some of these people that die mm -hmm. on the operating table, yes, and they see the light, and then yes. they come back, and they're Ooh. yes, yeah, they're not afraid of nothing. Exactly. They don't care if they mm -hmm. die in more. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's yep. Probably, yep. Yeah. Yeah. He was on the lot operating of table at all. Like right. <laughs> so he stayed there in this state of perfect tranquility, and according to Buddhism, he is forever, forever freed from the sufferings of the human condition. It's not like he would have to keep up something. He was done. That's it. Done. He was then tempted to leave his body and pass once and for all time into nirvana. Nirvana is a word that is similar in idea to moksha in Hinduism. So, do you remember how in Hinduism we talked about how we're all stuck on this wheel of samsara? Remember that? Yes. The hamster wheel of going around and around reincarnations. And the goal is to escape that and to attain moksha. And moksha means liberation or release. And when you attain moksha, then you never again need to go back in. It's like you've graduated. You don't need another round in samsara. Well, in uh, Buddhism, it's similar. Not identical, but similar in the understanding that you attain nirvana. So you escape samsara, you escape the cycle of reincarnation, and you attain, this is, this is point B, you attain nirvana. But nirvana literally means um, extinguishing or blowing out, like you blow out a candle. And it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit harder to understand nirvana than it is moksha. Uh, because there's a different understanding in Buddhism of what the soul is. But nevertheless, nirvana is a place that we can attain and pass into, although it's very mysterious as to what exactly happens either there or in that state. But it's a space or a, or a, or a state of eternal bliss, eternal peace, and that is ultimate salvation. So he was tempted to leave his body and just attain nirvana. He was already enlightened. He could have. But he had this depth of compassion. Compassion is a quality that's really lifted up in Buddhism. So he had this depth of compassion. And that compelled him to stay in the world, to remain in the world, to stay alive as a physical person, and to share his discoveries with fellow human beings. But he thought these discoveries would be really difficult to understand because they're not just passed along through intellectual knowledge. People have to do what I did. They have to meditate like I meditated. They have to wake up like I woke up in order to understand these things. 
he thought. So he thought, I'm, I'm not going to be able to just teach this stuff. It's, it's not teachable. You can't teach it. But he said, if even one person, though, if even one person grasps anything of what I'm trying to pass on to them, then it would be worth it. So he decided to stay, even though he thought he had a ridiculously hard job ahead of him. So he wondered, who do I go talk to? Who do I offer my teachings to? And his thought was those five mendicants. Remember those five? <laughs> who were disgusted with him when he got that bowl of rice and milk. So he looked for them, he found them, and at first they wouldn't talk to him. They were just like shunning, you know? And uh, it's like, you know, the mean girls in junior high, we're not gonna talk to you. So finally they just saw how radiant he was, how blissful, and they said something about him, his spiritual presence, you know, he knows something, and so we might as well listen to him. And so they sat, and the Buddha, he's now called, known as the Buddha because he's the awakened one. And the Buddha was perfectly radiant, perfectly calm, and he talked about uh, his teachings. And he set forth his teachings in a famous episode called his first sermon. This was the first sermon preached at a deer park near the city of Benares, Benares, India. At a deer a deer park. Where the deers? Yeah. D e e mm -hmm. or deer. D e e r. Yes, deer park. They had them back then. I assume they did. Yeah. Uh, so he gave his first sermon there, and uh, he taught the doctrines of the Middle Way <coughs> and the Four Noble Truths, and they gradually got what he was saying. They understood his teachings. These five. Now they, for all intents and purposes, were ju became just as enlightened as him. They had the exact same experience that he had. They were enlightened too. But they are not referred to as Buddhas because only the first one in every cycle of the universe, um, remember how the universe grows and decays and collapses? Okay, With every cycle, only the first one gets to be called the Buddha. Because that person woke up with no help, really, from anybody else. Everybody else is called a saint, or an arhat. So these people, these five mendicants, are now the first arhats, or the first saints. So the Buddha we talk about, Gautama, the, the understanding in Buddhism is, he, is that he's not the first or only Buddha. He's just the one for our He's cycle. just the one for this cycle of the universe. But as long as the universe is on this cycle, there will never be another Buddha. There will be millions of people, perhaps, that are just as enlightened as him, but they don't get that, the honor of that title because he was the first one who woke up without help from other people. Um, but there have been countless Buddhas before him, and there will be countless Buddhas to come. And so when we envision the one to come, that's when we talk about Maitreya the Buddha of the future, the chubby one in the Chinese restaurants where we rub his tummy. So there will be countless Buddhas in every go-around of the universe. And there have been countless Buddhas, but Gautama is ours. So you can never say to one of these people that are of the Buddha religion that you are a Buddhist. You are a Buddhist. No, they can say that they're Buddhists. You can say that. Hey, they can't. Yeah. Okay. Here's okay, the difference. You can say that. that they you can are say I am a Buddhist. Buddhist. Okay. You cannot say I am a Buddha. Buddha. Okay. Because there's only one Buddha. Okay. Okay. It's like saying I am a Christian, but you're not going to say I am Christ. I got you. Are you? Right. No problem. Okay. Didn't think so. <laughs> so, um, so these five arhats, these five saints, were the first followers of the Buddha. And uh, for the remaining 45 years of the Buddha's life, he gained a huge following. He was a teacher. He had lots and lots of disciples. He, had, he attracted this huge following, and that developed into what's known as the Sangha. The Sangha is the Buddhist community. And this is still the name that's used for the Buddhist community, the Sangha. It's kind of like we might call ourselves the the church, but not just this church, but like the universal church. You know, we talk about like the Christian church, like worldwide. Um, 
So the Senka is like all Buddhists around the world. Yes. So he was when he was doing all this teaching over the 45 years and gaining the following, he was teaching all of these people to how to become enlightened. Yes. And yeah. by following his his teachings. Teachings they did and meditating and meditating. Yeah. So um, he did, how they did the the Senka at the time was they lived in India and they had a monsoon season for three months. And so during the monsoon season, they would stay together in retreat and indoors, and they would meditate. And they would talk about his teachings, but spend a lot of the time meditating. And then the other nine months, they would go out traveling and teaching, more and more traveling, more and more traveling and teaching. And ultimately, their goal was to reach nirvana? They believed that they had reached nirvana. I mean, they, if, if you're enlightened, uh -huh. then there's no reason to be reincarnated. So they so the, so nirvana is guaranteed. Okay. If you're enlightened, nirvana is guaranteed. So they were teaching others. But they were teaching others so that others could reach nirvana because there are two great. I'm using the word evangelical here because what I mean by that word this because that word can mean fifty different things. But evangelical in the idea of trying to spread your religion. There are two religions in the world that focus on doing that. One's Christianity and the other is Buddhism trying to spread your teachings. Others, not so much. Yes. I mean, others will teach, like Islam will definitely teach, uh, Judaism will teach, but in terms of a history of going out and traveling lands and going places and really trying to like, you know, teach the next generation of folks, that kind of thing, Buddhism and Christianity really have that going on. For good or for bad. I mean, we know the history of that. Sometimes it hasn't always been pretty. Um, but like the Buddhist temple that we're going to go take a field trip to, uh, those of you who are able to go, when we get that set up um, in Hacienda Heights, that is a temple that came over here, a Buddhist group that came over here, I think from Taiwan, in order to teach Buddhism to the United States. And it's very similar to how, like how we Christians sent, have sent missionaries to other countries. So these two religions really do a lot of cross-cultural, international teaching of these things. And so, um, so that's what the early Senka did. Now, the one interesting thing about what was going on was that the Buddhist community at the time was formed uh, with all kinds of people from all walks of life, and men and women. Now, both of those are really radical departures from the Hinduism of that time. Now, Hinduism has developed and changed, in part because of how Buddhism influenced the conversation. Kind of like how Luther influenced the conversation of Christianity and the Roman Catholic Church really changed. Not changed everything, but changed some things. And you see that with Hinduism too. We talked about how Hinduism talked about the god Indra thousands of years ago and never talks about Indra today. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of development in religion. So one thing that the Buddha did was he opened up teaching to people from all walks of life, meaning all castes. This was really unusual because at the time, this isn't Hinduism today, but the Hinduism then was only really available for the Brahmins. People could pay the Brahmins to do rituals for them. But the average Joe, if you're not in the Brahmin caste, you're not going to go be religious and go do rituals on your own. And so for him, for the Buddha, to open this up, this spiritual teaching to anybody from all walks of life, and men and women, which was totally huge, um, these were really radical departures from what was going on in his day in India. So, to this day, being a Buddhist means to take refuge, it's called take refuge, in the three jewels. And uh, when I was last at the Buddhist temple, I saw a class on the three jewels. So this is known well. To be a Buddhist means to take refuge in the three jewels. Number one <coughs> is the Buddha, the Buddha himself. <coughs> And his life and his example, his model of meditation and so forth. Number two is the Dharma, and I'll explain this in a minute. 
And number three is the sangha, the community. Kind of like, you know, if you're going to be a Christian, you can be a Christian in your living room and never come to church, totally. But it's not going to have quite the same impact if you don't have a community. That's part of what it means to be a Christian. It's not just about your personal relationship with God, but it's also, you know, who are we in community? How can we be there for each other? How can we love and serve our neighbors? You know, we talk about the communal aspect as well. Same with Buddhism. To be a Buddhist, you could just be meditating in your own home, but part of what it means to be part of this religion is to be in community with one another. Okay, Dharma. Do you remember that word? Mm -hmm. When we talked about Hinduism, that word meant your own ethical duty. Remember that? In Buddhism, it means something different. In Buddhism, it means the teachings of the Buddha. It's just a different slant, different understanding of that word. So, to be a Buddhist means to take refuge in the three jewels. The Buddha himself, his, his, uh, his example, his meditation, the Dharma, which is his teachings, and then the Sangha, which is the community. Okay, I'm going to talk about the end of his life really fast, and then we'll talk much more about the philosophy and, and um, what happens after you die and, what, and how to do this and how, you know, enlightenment and all that next week because we're running out of time, and you're getting a lot right now anyway. So just to close this, and then we'll have some time for some discussion. At about the age of 80 years old, in 483 BCE, that is, again, an approximate year. We don't have a certainty on these things, but around 483 BCE, the Buddha became seriously ill after eating a meal of spoiled food. And he knew he was going to die. Now, one tradition says that he knew that the food was spoiled, but out of his compassion, he didn't want to refuse it. He's, he's always talked about it as being incredibly compassionate. So he ate this, um, this meal of spoiled food, and he literally died from food poisoning. And he said this, he, these are his last words, he said this, all the constituents of being, meaning everything that exists, all the constituents of being are transitory, meaning they're moving, they're going somewhere. Okay? And then he said, work out your salvation with diligence. So he basically said, I and all of us are going somewhere. So like my don't let my death bother you too much. I'm, you know, everybody's moving somewhere to some other state. But then he said, work out your salvation with diligence, which means that he told his followers, salvation is possible for you too. It's not like he's leaving and taking away all hope for anybody to become enlightened. He's like, you go do what I did, bye. <laughs> you know, as he's departing, he's leaving them with a sense that they can carry on their own religious practice and that they can become enlightened. He said, work out your salvation. And the term salvation, try not to hear that in Christian, with a Christian slant. When we say the term salvation, we mean you know, Jesus dying for our sins and us being, you know, united with God and that having to do with heaven and all. Salvation just simply, and that's a Christian understanding of salvation, sure, but salvation just simply means how to get from A to B. However you define A, however you define B, how to get from the human <coughs> condition to something else. And in Buddhism, the problem with the human condition was, well, we'll go through this a lot more next time, but having to do with karma, having to do with suffering, having to do with attachment, all kinds of other things. And then how do you get beyond it through the middle way, the four noble truths, to a place of enlightenment, which eventually will lead to nirvana. So we told everybody else, you can do this. Now again, it's not like he's God. It's not like he's perceived as divine. He's not. It might look, it might appear that way when you go, like when you go to the Buddhist temple and you see this huge statue of the Buddha and, and people are looking like they're praying. It almost looks like they're praying to God. That's technically not what's at least supposed to be happening. Remember he the idea a good of good teacher. He's an amazing teacher. Yeah. Yes. You know, remember the idea of religion in the books and religion on the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, religion in the books is what people are technically supposed to be doing. Religion on the ground is what people do. So the idea of like, do, um, do Catholic people um, expect the saints to, do, do they pray to the saints like they're gods? 
Well, religion in the book says no, Catholic people don't do that. They can ask the saints to pray for them, but they don't pray to them like they're gods. But in terms of religion on the ground, what do Catholics do? I don't know. It depends on the Catholic. Maybe they're just following what grandma does. Right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of religion in the books, do the Buddhists believe that the Buddha is God? No. No. He's not divine. But in terms of the folks, the people, depends on who you're talking to. There's a gigantic range among Buddhists, just like there is among Christians and everybody else. Okay? So he died and he ascended through these stages of meditation into a place of perfect tranquility and he passed forever into nirvana. Who went to heaven? Their heaven. That would be the closest thing to what they would call that, yeah. But there's a, a different understanding of what happens in nirvana, who, who even exists in nirvana. But it's, it's, the, it's a similarity, yeah. Where is he buried? Oh, that's a good question. Probably in Benares, but I don't know for sure. It's a I mean, good question. not a big shrine. There it might be, but I'm not sure. So according, according to this timeline, you said he was about 80. I need to look that up. He was about 80 when he yes. ate that spoiled food. Yes. But if he was born in 563, <laughs> that makes him well into his hundreds. Yes. 483 BCE, 563 BCE. Oh, isn't that 80? 83. This is 83 year plus another. Well, it's oh, BCE. Because it's, it's BCE. It's 30, 30. Years from this new 16. It's <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. 563 BC to 483 BC. Negative numbers. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Kim C. Kamsai. <laughs> okay, yes. I have a question. Questions, yes. Now, he died. Yes. We know he died. Now, the next year, the, the, I mean, the first person now that decides he's a Buddha. He takes over? No, there will never be another Buddha okay. in this go around of the universe. Boy, I missed that. There are lots of saints, there are lots of arhats, there are lots of people that are enlightened, but there's only one Buddha in this go around of the universe. Oh. Do, do you remember the understanding that we're in cyclical time? Yeah, yeah. And so we are now in one cycle of the universe. The Big Bang. Well, but there's like an infinite number of Big Bangs. There's not one. Begin only in the West do we think that time is linear, that there was one Big Bang or one Garden of Eden story, and that everything has gone on from there. In the East, the understanding is that it's always happened and it always will, around and around and around. So the fat guy and is not a Buddha. No, he's another. He's an image of what the future Buddha might look like. An image of. Okay. Yes, because no person who practices the Middle Way would look like Maitreya Buddha. Right? The middle way is a way of moderation. And so you'll see statues of the Buddha, or you'll see pictures of the Buddha. He's not looking like a concentration camp victim with his ribs poking out, but he's not looking jolly either. I don't mean to be mocking anybody, but this is what my trail looks all like. Right. <laughs> this is my trail. So, so the Buddha, Gautama, has this middle way between um, very large or very small. But there was an understanding that there would be a Buddha of the future, and so they car the sculptor carved a statue based on a person that was alive in a village at that time. And that's what Maitreya Buddha, the Buddha of the future, looks like. That's the one that's the, that's the larger one. Now, when I was in Vietnam, we had a uh, house girl that cleaned our barracks. Yeah. And she came in with a red dot. Okay. Okay. And uh, I asked her, I said, what's the red dot? Yeah. And she says, because I've got a headache. Okay. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Then maybe she had a she headache. Had a I'm not kidding. That's what she tried to tell me. Well, in Vietnam, you wouldn't have Hindus, right? But if you were married, you not more Buddhist. I think Buddha. Yeah, that's she? a Buddhist yeah. country. She was Buddha. I, I maybe she had a headache I mean, and put there something was on her Christians, head. There was Christians. Maybe she Buddha. got married and she didn't know how to tell you that. No, no, <laughs> I don't know. no. She didn't wear. Uh, did no. they wear her wedding rings? Her husband was her. Does Buddha wear? <laughs> <wedding rings? laughs> yeah. Her husband was her husband. Yeah. 
husband for a <laughs> time. <laughs> she was just calling her husband a fit name. Well, yeah. I got a headache. Yeah, we were husband <laughs> and a headache. Yeah, that's right. That is funny. <laughs> so. I just wondered. I'm just, you know, I remember that. I remember it as plain as day. And I'm going, well, why would you have that? Yeah. And uh, I, uh, she, she looked at me. And I don't said, know. I don't know why I anybody would call us a headache. I'm at a loss. Well, <laughs> I'll pray for it. All right, let's think about what we've learned so far. Does any of this surprise you? What do you find most interesting about this? Yeah. Are the four noble truths I know you're going to talk about them yes. next week? Yes. Are they connected to his four? No, not the watches. No, the three watches. No, they're different. There's always, like I said, three this and four that. There's going to be an eightfold path. But then we have a four something where he saw old death life. Oh, the four passing sights. Yeah, are they connected? No, oh, okay. no, totally I different. I was wondering if four or something. Yeah, that would be nice, but no, no, totally unrelated. What else? What's interesting to you? Or what could the rest of us learn from any of this? You'll get more that, into the philosophy later. Yeah. I never knew that the fat guy was the Buddha of the yeah. future. I thought that was yeah. the Buddha. I know. Um, mm -hmm. well, most, I saw him when I was in Vietnam. Uh, go out in the countryside and on the hill, you would there would be a temple there. Yeah. And we would go up to the temple mm -hmm. and there'd be people at the temple Meditating and they it. said that you could not go in there unless you removed your boots. Mm -hmm. Well, all of us kind of thought, yeah, there ain't no way I'm going to remove my boots here. And they start shooting and banging and everything else oh, around us. So, yeah. we, so I just looked in the door. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. And it was quite, quite a pretty place. Yeah. It was a fat. Buddha. Yeah, Maitreya. Yeah. yeah Every they, time you see the big they, one, it's Maitreya. Don't be offended when you say you got a fat Buddha sitting there. I, I don't know, but it's clearly depicted as down. chubbier. Someone's laying down like that. Right, but there's also, go to the temple and you'll see all kinds of statues and paintings and stuff of the Buddha that's not like that. And you'll go, oh, that's the one. That's Gautama. Gautama Buddha does not look chubby. Maitreya Buddha does. That's how to know who you're looking at. Okay. Oh. Now, now, here's another thing yeah. about compassion. Now, I always thought that a compassion is taught to you. I don't think people have compassion. It has to be taught to you by either your mother or someone or mm -hmm. whatever, your religion or whatever, it's mm -hmm. got to be taught to you. Mm -hmm. I, that's the way I perceive compassion. Okay. Now, I'm, I guess I'm wrong. I don't know. I, it seems to me like there's, there's compassion to definition. You, know, you, you, may have, you, be a, you may be a compassionate person, but until someone divide, defines mm -hmm. what a compassionate person is, yeah. you wouldn't know that you're a compassionate person. Does that make sense? Well, well, you know, what compassion is forgiving people. Compassion is that if you see if you see uh, someone hurting or someone yeah. or correct, you yeah. stop to help. Right, okay. and there are a lot of compassion is not to kill an animal that right. is not outright killed. There are a lot of stories we're going to talk about in the weeks to come of the Buddha showing compassion because it really is one of the prime virtues in Buddhism <laughs> is to have compassion. Absolutely, one of the top, if, if not the top, virtues to have compassion. What else? What else stands out to you folks? And like I said, this time you learned more history, the beginnings of it, the historical beginnings of it, than the founder. You're going to learn a lot more about the philosophy of it and the practices of it uh, next week and the week after that. But anything else stand out to you that's interesting or you have questions? Yeah, a question really. Buddhism started in India. Yes. And spread from there. It did. But why is it so much smaller in India today? It, it just really didn't take hold. There are a lot of other major religions in India. In addition to Hinduism, there's Jainism and Sikhism, and those are really big. Um, it, it really traveled through a couple of different routes up through China and then over into Japan and Korea as well and Thailand. And so those areas just really flourished with it. And in Japan, it developed into Zen Buddhism, which is so different that we're going to talk about it in a completely different day. Um, because that's a, di a very, very different way of doing Buddhism. But um, yeah, it's just, I don't know why it didn't stick in India. But there was a lot of contention between Buddhism and Hinduism in the beginning because they, they, were, they were seeing things so differently.
What's that other religion in India? Jaya, Jaya? Jainism. 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 Sometimes it's pronounced Jainism. It really uh, influenced um, Gandhi. Jainism or Jainism, and uh, you might you might see it, it, it's rarer, it's smaller, but um, these people wear kind of like masks over their face, mm -hmm. so they don't breathe in any microscopically tiny insects, because the biggest virtue in Jainism is nonviolence. Yeah. So trying not to step on ants, certainly vegetarian, you know, not wanting to harm anything, including breathing in tiny insects or any anything, because nonviolence is so huge. So that influenced Gandhi in his quest for nonviolence in India. Yeah. Anything else about Buddhism so far? Are you surprised to know that he's not seen as a god? As I'm divine? Did I'm you surprised there's a difference between I, I didn't know when yeah. I looked at the pictures. Yeah. I didn't know the difference. Right. Like I was surprised. Between that. what? So Maitreya? Maitreya. Yeah, Maitreya. Yeah, 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 the Buddha. Like, yes. I never so knew. that's Gautama. Right, and then this one, where's the big guy? This that's guy. Maitreya. Yeah. That's Maitreya. Yeah. But yeah. I never, I didn't know. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't, uh, we you know. know. We know. So much, yeah, why would we know? You know? Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that in and of itself yeah. right there is like, yeah, wow. yeah. You know, it seems to me that if this kid started this from little on, that he, and he was so sheltered, yeah. He had a very vivid imagination, and because he was a pri the, uh, prince's son, yes. uh, they catered to him, yes. and they agreed with him, yeah. and he made up stories in his head. Mm. He was a, a lonely, only person, saying mm. mm. living in that sheltered life, and mm. I think it just spread. He, I mean, oh my gosh, he sounds like a little nuts. <laughs> he did have yeah, friends. He, does. He, does. He, does. he had friends when he was a child growing up. Well, they probably believed him too if they told wild stories. <laughs> but he had, he was surrounded by people. He wasn't so much isolated. He oh. was isolated from the outside world. But he had cousins and you know all these servants, and he had lots of people around him all the time. But yes, he I was rich. He was pampered. Him, it's like a servant can't tell. Yeah, the prince's son. Yeah, you know, anything like yeah. oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, that's my thought on it. Buddhism there are... is a practice vice of religion. Oh yes. A, yeah. Practiced, yes, that's it's alive and well. Told. Very much so. Very very much so. Yeah. Um, I do hope you can go to the temple. You'll see amazing artwork. You'll meet fascinating people, and more than that, you'll get a sense of this amazing tranquility that will fall on you when you walk into the place. It's really interesting. You go into the, have any of you ever been there or seen it, the temple I'm talking about in Hacienda Heights? I've seen it from the outside. It's the largest Buddhist temple in the Western Hemisphere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we are so lucky that it's like right here. And uh, Hacienda Heights isn't that far from here to be able to go to the largest Buddhist temple in the Western Hemisphere. And you, you drive up to it, it looks like you're in China. I mean, it's just, it's huge and it's gorgeous. And then you walk in and you see a devotional kind of a room, but then you walk through the room into this open courtyard. So since you're in a courtyard with all these rooms around you that have all these things going on in them, but since you're in a courtyard with the sky above you, it feels familiar. Like you've seen the sky a million times. So it doesn't feel like you're in a foreign place. You're like, oh, it's the sky, it's trees, it's, you know, and you feel the sense of peace. It's amazing. The only time, I've been there many times, the only time I haven't felt peace is on the Buddha's birthday because it's really crowded on the Buddha's birthday. In fact, I was telling a Christian pastor that on the Buddha's birthday, there's a big celebration there, and, and he said... Big crowd. Yeah, oh my gosh, it's huge. Yeah. Yes, and... Uh, and he said, wow, they celebrate the Buddha's birthday. That's so neat. We should have something like that in Christianity. And I, I, said, <laughs> I said, you mean like, like Christmas? He's <laughs> like, oh, right. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, <my> God. <laughs> God. Remember that holiday that, you know, was kind of a big deal. Yeah, right. <laughs> so anyway, but I really hope you go. It's a gorgeous temple. It's very different yeah, than the Hindu one, one, which is also yeah. gorgeous. <laughs> Really, really yeah, different. So, when I take my shoes off. any last questions? We're at our time. Oh, yeah, we got to take your shoes off when we walk in. You do, so don't wear the socks with the holes in them. Oh, oh wear sandals <laughs> and then you have it easy. Yeah. I'm going to wear my But then you go barefoot.
Well, thank you all for coming well, out tonight. We're at our time. I will, see those, you, I will see those of you. I'm paranoid about walking. I will see those of you who can go on Saturday. Have a wonderful evening. God thank bless you. you all. Thank Let's you. go see the hot zone. The hot zone. Thank you. Watch that. Oh, we're watching. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The hot zone. Oh, that's it. Oh, that's it. Oh, that's it.